not only am I the director of the Institute for the, the Humanities, I'm also a professor in the Department of Humanities, so it gives me tremendous pleasure to welcome you here uh, tonight. Um, I would like uh, first to um, just acknowledge that we are on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, I'd also like uh, to acknowledge uh, the fact that it is December 6th today, um, and today, therefore, is the National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women. Um, this is the anniversary um, of the Montreal Massacre and reminds us of the importance of working against gender-based violence in our communities, in Canada, and around the world. This is a day of action and prompts us to take steps to end gender-based violence. And for those of you who don't know, the, the reason this is um, the National Day of Remembrance is because on uh, December 6th, 1989, a man walked into an engineering class at L'Ecole Polytechnique de Montréal. After separating the men and, from the women, he proclaimed that he, quote, hated feminists and shot 14 women in the class um, and beyond simply because they were women. So I think it's important that we uh, acknowledge um, uh, the day. So without any further ado, uh, it gives me tremendous um, pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, um, Jason Brown, um, who studied anthropology as an undergraduate, um, who has also a master's degree from Yale University in their forestry and theology program, uh, and a PhD um, from UBC in what he likes to call the earthy humanities. Um, his web page is Holyscapes, Landscapes of Earth and Soul. Um, he's a colleague of mine who teaches environmental humanities courses in the uh, Department of Global Humanities. He also teaches at Western Washington University. And you can see the title of, of his talk tonight, Placefulness, Why We Need a Contemplative Ecology for Troubled Times. So please um, join me in welcoming Jason. So welcome, thank you for being here. This is a really beautiful site. Um, I'm not sure what to make of this room. One part of me thinks I should, uh, we should have a cooking show. <laughs> another, part of me, another part of me thinks that perhaps we need to leave here with a very stern resolution for whatever we've come up with. <laughs> Feels like that kind of room where we build consensus, but spoiler alert, uh, I'm not interested in easy answers. I, well, maybe I'm interested in them, but I don't have them. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. Uh, I can tell it's a pretty eclectic group, and I'm very happy about that. I will do my best to, to get through the, the, the details and the prompts, and then I'll, turn it, uh, I'll, I'll open it up for discussion. So the, the order of the day is I'd like to uh, define this term, placefulness. I didn't make this up, I've seen it around, but uh, I don't think anyone has published any books on it. Um, it's not peacefulness, it's about sense of place, and I'll talk about what that means. I'm gonna uh, dip a little bit into my dissertation work, which connects and relates to um, Catholic monasticism and their sense of place. I'll do a little bit of biblical background, but I'll try to keep it um, minimal there. Um, I'll just sketch uh, what what uh, my dissertation describes as the monastic sense of place. Uh, and that, you know, that experience of interviewing monks and spending time in monasteries really um, turned a corner for me in terms of what I'm, you know, loosely calling a contemplative ecology, not just the lives of these monks who are devoted to God, but their way of life, uh, I think, has a lot to say to us. Uh, on the, on the verge of the so-called Anthropocene, the, the age of human domination. So I will outline some, some contours of what a contemplative ecology, or a placeful contemplative ecology looks like. And then I have three cautions and three troubles to really uh, get conversation going. I'll have some closing remarks, and then we'll open it up for discussion. So uh, we're living in what I like to call the fullness of times, which is any biblical scholars out there is a pun, but I, I'm afraid it doesn't land very well. That's a few. <laughs> it is a pun, I assure you. Um, but 
But uh, this notion of placefulness is sort of like nested in several other ideas. So many of you, I'm sure, have heard of the idea of mindfulness, which is an idea that uh, has been um, extracted and, and, uh, and promoted out of Buddhism and into a, a more wellness-oriented community. So the idea of being simply aware right, in each moment of our sensations, of our thoughts and our feelings, right, in each moment. Um, in, the, in the embodied spirituality kind of world, we've been talking about, come on, we've been talking about this idea of bodyfulness, right, so the mind, we're not just, we're not just these brains in a vat, but this idea that our whole body is involved in the process of awareness, uh, which is a, is a pretty powerful um, notion. So it's not, it's not necessarily separate from mindfulness, just a, a way of talking about it in a more embodied way. Uh, another one I really appreciate is this idea of timefulness, right? which is a, a recent book by a geologist uh, who is basically talking about the ways in which orienting ourselves in deep time can have a big impact on the way we uh, you know, perceive ourselves and the way we perceive big uh, intractable problems like climate change. And so placefulness then, I would say, doesn't exclude any of those, but absorbs them and says that uh, our awareness, our witnessing to, our attending to our places uh, is, is both a, an exercise of ideas and imagination, an exercise of the body, an exercise of a place embedded in historical and geological time and uh, in relation with other persons, right? some of which are human. So uh, that's kind of what I'm gesturing toward when I talk about placefulness. All right, so what I want to say about Archytas is that uh, in, at least in the Greek, in the Greek conception, uh, broadly construed, um, place is a primary category of existence. Right? To be is to be in place. And um, uh, this is a, a pretty powerful notion for indigenous peoples, of course, uh, but also in, in our pre-enlightenment imagination. It's really in the enlightenment that we start to see the privileging of like a kind of grid geometric existential space, right? Like we exist in this grid of three-dimensional space and uh, Places are just coordinates in that space, right? Social science in the early 20th century really picked this up. And so we got, we got this notion of the social construction of everything, right? Social construction had a lot to do with space, this um, existentially understood. Um, uh, but it also uh, had to do with this very common Western dichotomy between the subjective and the objective. Right, so the idea was that we, that human subjects, political subjects, construct space and then project meaning onto objective nature. So the nature is everywhere the same, but cultural subjectivities orient themselves differently and then come to understand culturally uh, places in different ways. Right, this was a kind of a, uh, the idea that landscape is simply a mirror to the culture, like a symbolic landscape, right? This was a very common notion of place um, in the early 20th century in the social sciences. Uh, in the mid 20th century, however, we started to pivot to a more phenomenological approach. And when I say phenomenology, right, I'm just talking about the idea that it's more embodied and it's more experiential, okay? so. The construction of space doesn't take place in a, in a brain in a vat and then somehow projects outward onto a, a, a objective nature. Our relationship to places is embodied, right? It's, it's situated, okay? So folks like Edward Ralph, uh, Yifu Tuan, they're absorbing some of the, the philosophy of um, Martin Heidegger, of um, 
Maurice Merleau-Ponty, right? This phenomenological shift that's really subverting and, you know, in some ways rejecting the philosophy of Rene Descartes, right? Who said that everything comes in these dual um, packages of subject, object, culture, nature. So the phenomenology of play, um, uh, the phenomenological movement in geography and anthropology really re recovered this idea of place, right? Place really came back into vogue with this phenomenological turn. So we get folks like Yifu Tuan talking about topophilia, right? This idea that we have like an inherent um, longing for and love for our places. Or the idea from Tim Ingold, the anthropologist, that dwelling is this kind of, um, uh, the way is, is a way that the body mediates between places and ideas, right? A dwelling perspective is a very phenomenological approach. Or uh, to take it, to zoom it out even further, we could talk about things like biophilia, right? Uh, E.O. Wilson, Stephen Kellert, and others talked about this idea that there was something innate in our, um, our species, right? That was interested in life, that's interested and drawn to uh, living things. And so topophilia, biophilia is this idea there's something deep in our, in our bones that wants to connect with other living beings and be rooted in place. Of course, biophilia also, um, uh, really tried to shift the conversation in terms of anthropocentrism, right? This idea that humans are at the center of all of our values and ethics to a more biocentric or ecocentric approach, right? So uh, shifting away from uh, the human being as the pivot around which everything else is uh, um, rotating. And so uh, Christian Norbert Schultz, uh, he talks about this idea of dwelling, the dwelling perspective being the idea that we belong to places. We don't just, we don't just um, come upon a, a culturally neutral, objective nature and then project meaning onto it, right? Places speak for themselves. Uh, creatures name themselves, right? The, the features, the affordances uh, of the place participate in the meaning that we give them, right? So to live is to dwell, right? To dwell means to belong to a particular place. And so that's really at the heart of this phenomenological shift. And uh, anthropologically, this was really um, absorbed into a lot of our ethnographies in the late 20th century. So for example, Bruce Chatwin's book, The Song Lines, is a kind of a more popular rendering of a lot of really good ethnographic work, um, but interesting nonetheless, where he really illustrates just how deep some of these connections to place can be. So uh, in Aboriginal cosmology, uh, the, the, the world began, right, in this sort of every when of the dream time. And the primordial beings of the dream time emerged out of the earth and walked in these tracks along the, along the country. And every person who's born has a dreaming, right? That means they have a, a, a totemic or a, a primordial ancestor who was that first ancestor that came out of the earth. So the kangaroo or the lizard or the bandicoot or the badger, right? These are, uh, these are dreamings and you are born into these dreamings. So an initiate into a dreaming will get a portion of what's called a song line. And a song line is the song that that ancestor sang as they traversed the landscape and uh, created the features, right? Dragging their feet or stomping, right? So the features of the landscape were created by the dreaming. And so a really talented um, initiate could listen to a song line, even in a different language, and uh, because the song line traces the tempo and the melody of 
of the of the landscape, right? So like lo long flats for for salt flats or choppy, uh, you know, tempos for for mountains. They can they can actually pinpoint right where that song line traces, what or where that song line traverses. So you could imagine that a highway or a, or a mining project or a forestry industry would have a very different impact on a people who are that embedded in place. As another example, uh, Keith Basso's work in, in, in um, the American West with the Western Apache shows how the landscape is actually a partner in teaching the people. So he talks about how place names, which are fairly descriptive, right? So you can see here, um, coarse textured rocks lie above in a compact cluster is a, is a, is a, comp, uh, a compound place name, right? It refers to a particular place. And most uh, traditional place names are fairly descriptive of something that either happens there, like you know, harvesting bark or fish, or something that, some feature like cottonwood trees or rocks. Now what happens if you stay in one place long enough is those places start to accumulate stories, right? And so in the case of the Western Apache, those places have accumulated so many stories that those stories are now part of not just the physical landscape, but a moral landscape. So they teach you how to be an Apache. So there's lots of examples, but just for one example, uh, one of the main characters in the, in the ethnography, Ruth, Ruth has a has a strange encounter with a loved one where um, she's uh, assaulted. And uh, her, her commute to school every day goes past this particular place name, right? And that, there's a story attached to that place that talks about the uh, attempted incest of a, of, a, of a man long ago. And so Ruth says, That's, I know that place. It stalks me every day, right? So this is not just the idea that cultures develop these long-lasting relationships to place and it's warm and fuzzy and it's all animism and kinship, right? These are also landscapes of trauma, right? Landscapes of wounding. Uh, and that is, you can't have sense of place without that, right? It's, it's, it's the good, it's the bad, it's the ugly, as we'll see. Now, I don't uh, like to, or claim, or I never, tell uh, Coast Salish stories in public. I only refer to the ones that are publicly available. That's, you know, those stories are not mine to tell. But these are places that are publicly known and, and talked about, uh, but they, they speak to our context and the relationship that many Coast Salish peoples have to their places. And again, that's not my spiritual ecology to describe, but in many Coast Salish peoples around uh, where we live, there are transformer sites, right? These particular either geologic uh, features or um, rivers or, or confluence of rivers where um, transformer spirits have, have basically monumentalized something, right? So for example, what settlers call the Lion's Peak are, are also the, tw the twin sisters, right, which were immortalized in stone for negotiating a peace treaty. Or the, uh, the chief in Squamish uh, is a immortalized longhouse, an ancient longhouse. Or in Stanley Park, what's called Skalsh Rock, right, is a, a man who was uh, purifying himself in the, in the ocean before his child was born. And he was confronted by four sort of mysterious beings who told him to get out of the way. He refused to get out of the way because he wanted to purify himself, purify himself before his child was born. And the immortal beings you know, said, you know, we could kill you, right? And he says, yes, but I need to purify myself. Right? For his obstinance, they were quite impressed and turned him into uh, the, the monument that you see here, right? That geologists talk about being a volcanic intrusion of igneous rock. Or, for example, um, uh, uh, supernatural beings like Thunderbird, who's, who shoot lightning out of their eyes, uh, any obsidian deposits that you might find in the local mountains are places where Thunderbird shot lightning out of his eyes, right? So that's just an example of publicly available um, 
uh, places of deep meaning and story uh, that, that connect Coast Salish people to their places. Again, just sort of the tip of the iceberg. Uh, spiritually speaking, uh, Simone Weil, a, a philosopher whose all of her work was published po posthumously, talks about the idea that place is a spiritual phenomenon as well. Right? She says that to be rooted is perhaps the most important and least recognized need of the human soul. So this idea that we crave uh, context, orientation, right, um, origin stories, uh, teleologies, right, and once again that has that has that cuts both ways, right, because this this notion of being uprooted can sometimes be weaponized, which we'll talk about, against people who have been displaced, right, like Romani peoples or or um, Jewish peoples. Now, um, in, the, in the Hebrew Bible, one of the ways you can talk about the Hebrew Bible is as a kind of uh, farmer's almanac and a catalog of place names, right? Many of the stories uh, in the Hebrew Bible are sandwiched with place names, why and where certain events happen. Come on in, there's some seats here, yeah. Um, so Walter Brueggemann, who's a, uh, a biblical scholar, he talks about it, uh, he, he, I mean, he really raises the stakes, right? He says, in the Bible, there is no timeless space and there is no spaceless time. There's only storied places, right? Places that ha has meaning because the history is lodged there, right? So these are the, the axis mundi, right, of Murcia Eliadi. Right, these are um, holy places, holy scapes, as I like to call them. So, for example, where Jacob wrestles with the angelic being, right, becomes Penuel, right, the place of, of facing God and living. But throughout the Hebrew Bible, there's all kinds of examples of this, right? Uh, stone altars, gardens, groves of trees, and mountain peaks in particular, right, places of theophany, places of revelation. Uh, where Moses receives the law, the Torah. Uh, these are holy places, right? And later Christians would, would elaborate on those and you know, found monasteries around those places. But throughout the Hebrew Bible, there's also this sort of what I would call like a place-space motif, uh, uh, which is kind of a tension between the motif of the paradise garden and the desert wilderness. This is one of my favorite motifs, so I don't know, probably every class I've ever taught, I talk about this at some point. But basically, right, the biblical story begins in the garden. Adam and Eve are exiled from the garden. And basically, every story after that is this longing to return to the garden. And all of the narratives around obedience, all of the narratives around judgment, all of the narratives around uh, reward, right, are all couched in this axis between the lush paradise garden of Eden and the, the wasteland, the desert, the wilderness, right? The wust, right? The midbar. Um, and so uh, the whole arc of the story is this longing to return from exile to the garden. And that, that motif was absorbed into Christianity and I would say also absorbed into modernity, secularized into modernity, right? So all of our techno-optimistic, um, uh, eco-modernist storylines are essentially this idea that uh, we don't just covenant with God to get the garden, we build it ourselves, right? So there's this notion of, of a humanist sort of paradise garden that we're responsible for. It's our, it's our task, right? So. Uh, in, the, in the Hebrew mythology, in, in Christian eschatology, monastic, and in the, in the sort of secularized humanism of modernity. Now, an interesting thing about Christianity um, is, you know, the, the Orthodox traditions and Catholic traditions have a, have a real deep love for places, holy wells, holy trees, saints, you know, graves, cathedrals, sacred spaces, a big part of those Christianities. Um, 
Protestantism, however, has a much more fraught relationship with place, with sacredness, uh, sacramentality. But at the heart of all of these traditions, there seems to be a kind of tension between right, the places that Jesus recapitulates as the Messiah, the Mashiach, right? He's born in Bethlehem. He's exiled in Egypt. He comes to Jerusalem, right? He, he ascends Mount Tabor, is transfigured, and finally is nailed to a tree, right? Which is the tree of life. And the tomb where he's resurrected is the garden of the resurrection. So all of that, all of the motifs in the, the, the Jesus myth are directly tied to these places in the Hebrew text. But he also ascends to heaven, bodily into heaven, right? So, you know, how many Christians have sat around wondering, like, where's his body, right? Like, in this spaceless void, right? So there's, there's this interesting paradox in Christianity of, of embodiment, incarnational Christianity, and place, right, sacred places and this kind of mystic placelessness that transcends time and space. Uh, so Belden Lane is a scholar that I use quite a lot. He says, one finds a continuing tension between place and placelessness, between the local and the universal. God is here in this place at Bethlehem, Lourdes, Iona, even Boston and Salt Lake. But God is also not here, right, transcendent, other, so that, all that to be said, um, uh, for my PhD dissertation, I did about 50 interviews with monks. Some of them were on foot, walking uh, on the land. Some of them were seated. And uh, I had a lot of great conversations with these monks about their spirituality and about their sense of place. This is Brother John. Uh, he died uh, recently uh, doing what he loved, which was work. He was he was mowing the lawn, and he just had a heart attack and died. But we did, we did our interview in the hospital. He had, just, he had just had a heart attack. And when I walked in, he was eating two pancakes just slathered with butter. And he was just like, that's how it is. That's how I live. And so, um, but he was one of my favorite people in the world. And uh, he was much stronger than me, even at 85, and was pushing wheelbarrows up hills, you know, like when we were doing trail maintenance at the monastery. Um, so anyways, I, I got really close with a lot of these monks, and I've been back many times since. But the arc of the data that I collected was around how the monastic life uh, opens an opportunity for monks to forge deep relationships with their places. So I'm not saying it's inevitable. I'm not saying every monk is, has this romantic and, uh, uh, notion of place or that they're in love with their places or even that they know that much about the local ecology. But the life of a monk um, lends itself to a really deep connection to place. So for example, all of the imagery, all the imaginings of what it means to be a monk is to be like Christ going into the desert or like St. Anthony the Great going off into the desert to live uh, you know, just in the wilderness uh, in silence and solitude. But they do that together, right? They're alone together. So when a monk joins a monastery, he takes a vow of stability. And that means that he is committing to the place and to the community. And many of the monks see themselves and take quite seriously the, the idea that they've been called to become lovers of the place, right? They are married, in a sense, into a community and to a place. And so that presents, while they're being formed in monasticism, that presents a lot of opportunities to walk the land, to get to know the land, uh, and to, uh, to, get, to commune with God through the land. Um, their daily and seasonal liturgies, right? The liturgy is the active service in the, in the monastery. So the, the chanting seven times a day, the daily mass, all of the seasonal masses like Christmas and Easter. Each of those, in, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, takes place in a kind of, um, in, a, in harmony with our seasons, right? So the lowest time of the year, uh, the, the, the darkest time of the year is the time when uh, Christ is born, Christmas, the, the winter solstice. And the, the, the equinox, the spring equinox, is the time when, uh, when, the, when the trees are leafing out, right? So the, the death of winter is being resurrected into the life of spring, right? So 
Uh, especially if you live in an orchard and you're having Easter and all of the plum blossoms are just going crazy, right? It, it's, it's a lot easier to believe in the possibility of resurrection if you're living on the land where the land it, itself is resurrecting before your eyes, right? The sort of mystical body of Christ in the land. So that presents itself, with, that's a real opportunity for these monks to, uh, you know, synchronize themselves with the place. The other would be manual work. Now, a lot of these monks are getting quite old, so they're not always able to do manual work every day. But you know, in their heyday, they were you know, running orchards, and they had forestry operations. They were baling hay. Uh, they had dairy uh, farms. And the spirituality of work is a really important part of their day-to-day -day life, especially if, for example, you have a kind of epiphany while you're pruning a uh, a plum tree or something, right? Uh, one monk in particular was really considering leaving the monastery because he just thought it was too much. I don't like getting up at three in the morning. I'm tired of this, right? Uh, but then just standing in this uh, tree, he saw himself in the tree, right? As a kind of um, uh, a tree who was being pruned and prepared by God to fruit, right? So he saw himself in that tree. And that place where that happened has always been a part of his sacred moral landscape, right? So memories and lessons start to accumulate in the landscape. And I bet if you reflected right now, even if you've been in Vancouver for uh, less than a year, there are probably particular places that you'll always have a one memory that crops up for you, right? Like whenever I come over the, the Granville Bridge into Vancouver, I remember the first time I ever crossed the border with all the stuff in my truck and coming to Canada to do my PhD, right? I'll never not associate that bridge with that first trip. So it happens to all of us, but you spend long enough in a place, you spend enough generations in a place, and those stories and those lessons really start to accumulate. And for the mystic, right, those places aren't always going to be the same. Right? So you might have a particular place, like there might be a shrine to Mary up on a hill. And you know, we would think, oh, well, that must be a very sacred place. But a lot of the monks' sacred and spiritual experiences happen to them at times when they're not really expecting it. That's why they call them charged. Well, one of the monks called it a charged moment. Right? He was walking by a, a tree that he had walked by a thousand times. But on that day, at that hour, it had this powerful mystic sensibility to it. Right? And so uh, places don't always present themselves as being particularly sacred until they reveal themselves to be that way. Right? And that's, that's part of, the, um, that's part of the, the spread of this uh, monastic sense of place. So on the vow of stability, for example, one of the monks at New Clairvaux Abbey, which is a Trappist Abbey in central California, he said, you become part of the land. Our vow of stability grounds us. And an image that was really helpful for me was the idea of these trees. He's pointing to the orchard. Uh, and to the, they have these massive um, redwood trees and oak trees. Right? He says, um, uh, these, roots, these trees taking root. You know we've got 30 feet of topsoil, and the roots go deep. So that was the image I had of stability. The longer I stay here, the more I can see myself growing in ways I never thought possible. It's, of course, not always easy staying in one place, but the longer you stay, the higher you can reach. All right, so he's talking, he's using the imagery available to him, right, the trees, to talk about his own vocation as a monk in a particular place. Another monk, uh, this is in New Mexico, right? So the uh, Christ in the Desert Abbey is a Benedictine abbey. Talking about the Psalms, he says, any monk who has spent his life chanting the divine office cannot have any experience and not have it reflect, not give utterance in the psalmody, right? The 150 Psalms that they chant seven times a day. The psalmody is a great template to place on the world for understanding it and its language becomes your own. So taking the poetic imagery from the Psalms, which is very land-based, very agrarian, and using that symbolism to uh, interpret the landscape, right? So that's what we would call more of a symbolic landscape, 
right? Going out onto the land and interpreting it. But it goes the other way as well. So uh, this is the driveway into Christ in the Desert. It's basically a 13-mile dirt road that is sometimes passable if it's dry. Um, they say it's a journey of faith to get to the monastery. Um, but this particular story that I'm going to read is from a monk who, who was walking on this road during a snowstorm. And he was like, oh, I better get back. It just suddenly, right, the weather is crazy there. He said, I better get back. But he, he found himself lost somehow in this very clear canyon. I'm not sure how. But he found himself lost, and he was terrified. And when he got back to the monastery, the office that they were chanting was this psalm from 111. It says, uh, and it, this Psalm 111 basically says, right, talks about the fear of the Lord, right? So he didn't take that psalm and go out onto the land and make meaning with the land, right? The land itself populated that psalm, right? It infiltrated the psalm. So his phenomenological experience, right, came into and shaped the way he understood the psalms. So it goes both ways, right? The imagery from the psalms and the features of, and experiences on the land, right? He says, that psalm took on a whole different meaning for me and a whole different depth. And when I say that psalm now, I immediately connect with that experience I had out there in the wilderness. So when I left the monastery and you know, made sense of all this data, it was pretty clear to me that their way of life was very impressive and it had something to say about the way that we live. And I think uh, that sense of place has a lot to teach us, especially the monastic and the contemplative sense of place. So many, you know, people uh, love to bash modernity, but there's a lot of different, and so there's a lot of different ways we can talk about it, right? The modern malaise, right? The crisis of meaning. But there's something about our technology and efficiency that has been a bit of a trade-off, right, uh, to put it mildly, with this sense of place, with connection to each other, right? So uh, Vincent Vicina says, we in the West are homeless even if we have a place to live. So to, pe to speak in kind of broad strokes, right, there's something about European descended folks where we have a fraught relationship with place. Right, uh, Gertrude Stein talking about her home, uh, her home city of, of Oakland was saying, "There's no there, there, right? There's no nothing you can remember about it because I think her neighborhood was basically leveled and re rebuilt, right? Redeveloped, or even coming here on the SkyTrain, uh, the, the corner of Canby and King Edward, uh, the, let's see the south." East corner it used to be a big house right on the corner, and one day to the next it was completely gone. Right, it wasn't my house, but it was still a strange experience to to have that sort of psychic piece of your ecosystem that radically transformed that quickly. Or flying in a plane from one climate to the next, right? That can be really quite strange, going from winter to summer, right? That it's too fast for our brain to assimilate. Uh, actually, in, in, for example, in Wisdom Sits in Places, there's a part of the ethnography where they're driving along, right? And Keith Basso is taking notes on the place names. And the, his, his informant is just like sweating bullets because he's trying to say all these place names really quick. And he realizes that those place names are meant to be recited on foot, right? They're driving past. They're driving past this through this landscape. And he's speaking at the, at the speed of walking. Uh, he wants to, but they're driving through it, right? So however you want to come to it, there's something about the modern emphasis on universality, on, um, on efficiency that has, we've lost the sense of place, right? We've been uprooted. We've, we've, we've inhabited placeless places, uh, and in some cases been very much involved in the displacement of indigenous peoples. Now, postmodern architecture said, oh, we, we can fix that for you. And so they've, they've turned our malls into small domestic warm feeling or town center TM, right? This, I mean, this was very prominent in Southern California where I grew up where it was just like, 
you could tell that the mall was the new town square, right? Orange County is very per, uh, you know, marginal in Southern California, but the, the town center right, was the place where everyone was hanging out. And so we find ourselves in the so-called Anthropocene or the Capitalocene, right, this age of human domination, where um, we're not just having a crisis of species extinction and climate, which we are, we're also having a crisis of meaning uh, and connection to each other, right? So uh, um, sense of place and placefulness recognizes that we have um, some spiritual activism to do as well as political and social. So a contemplative ecology would be something along those lines, right? A contemplative is someone who's interested in uh, uh, accessing the sacred through stillness and silence, through quiet, right? Much more interested in quiet than in the spoken word. But there's a whole range of, of uh, ways of engaging, right? So I would, you know, we would call it more activist, spiritual activism. Spiritual ecology is one way to talk about it, or Pope Francis would call it an integral ecology in his encyclical. Let Ato see. Basically, the idea, right, that the earth is a sacred being to which we belong, not a problem to be solved. Uh, Bioregionalism is, is much more of a, a political manifestation of this, but it, it relates to the emphasis on place. But the idea that we should maybe start rethinking our cultural boundaries along ecological boundaries, ones that make more sense with watersheds and other biocultural boundaries. For example, they did a study in northern British Columbia recently that found out that the genetics of grizzly bears basically overlays perfectly with the language groups of, of central and northern British Columbia, right? So really interesting bioregional phenomenon. Uh, Joanna Macy, pictured here, is, has been a, is a, a major force for good within the environmental movement, who, ha, who basically, um, a lot of environmentalists were burning out, right, because they, they weren't able to connect with the grief that they were feeling because they felt like they had to power through. So Joanna Macy, who comes from a Christian background uh, but, but converted to Buddhism, has done a lot of work in what she calls the work to reconnect, that reconnects is basically this idea of talking about the grief that we feel about the environmental movement and then you know, enlisting that grief in healing and re-energizing. My own paradigm, uh, my website, Holyscapes, is about uh, connecting the domains of, the, of my own contemplative Catholicism with my interest in, in forestry and ecology, so this relationship between the inscape, right? Gerard Manley Hopkins talks about the inscape, the landscape of the soul, and the physical environment. And just to uh, plug, shamelessly plug my book, uh, in 2023, uh, my account of the monks will be coming out, The Dwelling in the Wilderness, A Liturgy of Place for the Anthropocene, coming to a bookstore near you. <laughs> All right. So when I, when I imagine placefulness, Hopefully not uh, Amazon. Don't buy it on Amazon, right? <laughs> this is being taped. All right. um, when I imagine what placefulness looks like, it's something like this. It's learning the liturgy of the place, right? And again, when I say liturgy, that's a religious term for the services that happen in the church, the morning prayer, the evening prayer, the, the midday prayer, the mass. But the procession of the seasons, right, winter, summer, uh, the, the, the leafing out of the trees is a kind of liturgy. And so to me, a uh, contemplative ecology that is placeful is one that is interested in embedding oneself, immersing oneself in the cycles of the year, the seasons of your place. So the sun, the moon, and the stars, even astrology, the archetypes, the, the, the star stories, the seasons, the weather, the topography, the, the, the deep time geology, the names of plants, right? Latin common or indigenous, the life ways of food and medicine and of, of fungi, uh, what's useful, but also just what is, uh, the soundscapes of local birds. 
and a, a deep awareness of where your own life intersects with particular places, right? So I have a picture here from right, Lynn Canyon. I love to walk here, but a lot of my placefulness happens in my neighborhood in Vancouver, right? Or a lot of my placefulness happens in uh, Mountain View Cemetery, or a lot of my placefulness happens in what used to be a rock quarry and now is a botanical garden, Queen Elizabeth Park, right? So this is not a wilderness or, or um, you know, even uh, particularly wild space um, uh, idea. You don't need it to be that, though it is, of course, welcome. So a few contours uh, beyond this liturgy of place. Robin Wall Kimmerer talks about the idea of becoming comfortable with a grammar of animacy and kinship. So talking about personhoods that are not just human. Okay, so we live in particular places. We have relationships with other humans. Uh, we, need, we, could, we should or could potentially entertain the idea that there are personhoods in our places that aren't necessarily human. Right, so Kimmerer says the language we speak, her own language, right, is an affront to the ears of the colonists in every way because it is a language that challenges the fundamental tenets of Western thinking, that humans alone are possessed of rights and all the rest of the living world exists for human use. Those whom my ancestors called relatives were renamed natural resources. Right? In contrast to verb-based Potawatomi, the English language is made up primarily of nouns, somehow appropriate for a culture so obsessed with things. So entertaining the possibility of non-human personhood in our places, and even of kin. Uh, Llewellyn Vonley is a, is a Sufi writer who wrote a book called Spiritual Ecology, uh, the same. Uh, name from the, for the movement. Um, and he talks about, well, he, he puts a real strong emphasis on the Sufi idea of the oneness of God, Tawhid. And he says, right, I, I paraphrased it earlier, the world is not a problem to be solved. It's a living being to which we belong. The world is part of our own self, and we are a part of its suffering wholeness. Until we go to the root of our image of separateness, there can be no healing. Uh, Richard Nelson spent a lot of his time as an anthropologist in Haida Gwaii, and he lived for a very long time in a particular island of Haida Gwaii, and at one point realized that you know, all of the food that he was harvesting and all the hunting that he was doing was essentially the matter that made up his body. So he saw himself becoming one, right, with the place that he was dwelling. And this uh, strikes me as a particularly beautiful privilege, but it's also kind of a beautiful notion of how, uh, how earthy and how embedded we are in the world, right? He says, there is nothing in me that is not of earth. No split instant of separateness, no particle that disunites me from the surroundings. I am no less than the earth itself. The rivers run through my veins, the winds blow in and out of my breath. The soil makes my flesh, the sun's heat smolders inside me. A sickness or injury that befalls the earth befalls me. A fouled molecule that runs through the earth runs through me. Where the earth is cleansed and nourished, it purifies, its purity infuses me. The life of the earth is my life. My eyes are the earth gazing at itself. So that, you know, deep connection with food and with place led him to this realization uh, on, and, his, and his relationship with Haida peoples. Another idea is that as we begin to um, restore ecosystems and, and engage in ecological restoration projects, we're not just you know, repairing an intact ecosystem, we're actually engaging in a kind of ritual practice or ritual emplacement. So restoration is also restoration, right? We're restoring ourselves into the place. We're telling our story, connecting ourselves back to places. So Stephanie Mills writes, 
The act of restoration gives people a basis for commitment to a place, I would say, and an ecosystem. It is very real. People often say, we have to change the way everybody thinks. Well, my god, that's hard work. How do you do that? A very powerful way to do that is by engaging people in experiences. It's ritual we're talking about. Restoration is an excellent occasion for the evolution of a new ritual tradition. All right. Um, well, uh, and so I, I also want to leave room for the peripatetic, the pilgrims among us, right? People who have itchy feet, who love to travel. I don't think that placefulness only applies, like, so this means you need to apply a 100-mile diet and not leave that radius for the rest of your life, or you're being a bad, placeful person, right? Placefulness is an orientation, it's a stance, it's a posture to any place that you may visit, right? And I think, I love the notion of pilgrimage. I, before I started working at SFU, I did the Camino de Santiago, the French way, I uh, walked across northern Spain, and that was a really beautiful experience. And I was moving you know, every day. I was on foot, but there was still a strong sense of the power of place and the power of movement through places. So Thomas Burton, one of my um, spiritual mentors, uh, has, says it this way, right? The geographical pilgrimage is the symbolic acting out of an inner journey. The inner journey is the interpolation of the meaning and signs of the outer pilgrimage. One, uh, one can have one without the other, but it is best to have both, right? So this, it's, again, this is very much uh, where my notion of holyscapes come from, right? That the, in, the inner landscape reflects and mirrors the uh, physical landscape. All right. So where we're at now is I've got three cautions and three troubles, and then uh, a, a concluding slide, and we'll, we'll open it up for discussion, OK? You're still with me? All right. <laughs> then, yeah, we'll, have, we'll definitely have some time for discussion. But there are going to be some quotes. There, I know it's, it's quote heavy, but I'll, I'll try to read them slowly. All right, my first caution is beware spiritual extractivism. So again, back to Belden Lane. Um, one of the things that can come up, especially in spiritual circles, spiritual ecology circles, or places like wild churches, is that we gather in a circle and we're so eager to have a spiritual experience that we just go out there and we're just like, I'm going to you know, impose symbols on everything. There's so much meaning in this acorn, right? And there, it's a beautiful feeling to, to, to connect with the world, but we, it shouldn't become a kind of, right, another kind of resource. Right, that we're consuming. So beware extracting as, as a practice. Right. So this is just, I couldn't have said it better, Belden Lane, he says, the challenge is to honor the thing itself as well as the thing as metaphor. When Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson declared in 1836 that every natural fact is a symbol of some spiritual fact, he sent people racing to the woods, anticipating the voice of God in the call of every thrush, and the voice of God is in every thrush, by the way. But too often, they paid scant attention to the songbird in their anxiousness to hear some transcendent message. They returned home full of nothing but themselves, their pockets stuffed with metaphors. As the imagination reaches relentlessly for a timeless interior soulscape, it is easy to sail over the specificity of particular landscapes. You see what I mean? I couldn't have said it better myself, right? It's a, kind of, it's a kind of symbol that's obscuring the thing itself. We're so interested in the meaning or the interpretation or the spiritual experience that we're, we forget to be there now, be here now, right? So that's placefulness. That's a, our first caution in a practice of placefulness. The second caution is, I mean, it's, it's aimed right at me. So again, I, I, I know, I recognize the irony, but this is aimed right at me. Beware dissociative jargon. Now, specialized language is one thing. I don't mind specialized language. When I go to the mechanic, I want him to speak to me in you know, specialized language. And when I talk about the humanities or religious studies, I'm going to use specialized language. But sometimes our, our language 
has, has been forged in the furnace of academia for so long that they've become culturally sterile, culturally neutral. And Wendell Berry has an amazing caution against this, right, the writer. He says, no settled family or community has ever called its home place an environment. Ouch, right? Environmental humanities, right? Earthy humanities. None has ever called its feeling for its home place bi uh, biocentric or anthropocentric. Guilty, right? None has ever thought of its connection to its home place as ecological, deep or shallow. The concepts and insights of the ecologists are of great usefulness in our predicament. And we can hardly escape the need to speak of ecology and ecosystems. We need it. But the terms themselves are culturally sterile. They come from the juiceless, abstract intellectuality of the universities, which was invented to disconnect, displace, and disembody the mind. The real names for the environment are the names of the rivers and the river valleys, creeks, ridges, and mountains, towns and cities, lakes, woodlands, lanes, roads, creatures, and people. Right? Amen. So I'm, I'm, all, for, I'm all for specialized language, but this caution is a powerful one to me that I think a lot about. This dissociative jargon, this dissociative, it distances us from the things themselves, right? Just like uh, going out into the woods looking for a spiritual experience can, can do. All right, caution number three. Beware of easy arrivals. Now, um, place can sometimes turn into a kind of country club mentality or a national park <laughs> mentality, right? A lot of Western projects are oriented towards purification and arrival or at some primordial essence. What was it first? What is it originally, right? Replacement, we wanna fix it, we wanna restore it, we wanna purify it, right? Again, this is rooted in that biblical tension between the paradise garden and the desert wilderness. Our national parks are a great example. In many cases, they were cleansed of their indigenous people in order that nature could be protected in its primordial sense, right? The irony, of course, is that Yosemite Valley was a food system for thousands of years until John Muir stumbled upon it and called it a wilderness or a temple, right? So uh, just because we feel like we're in the wilderness or a wild place doesn't mean we're having a more authentic experience of place than if we're in a city or in a suburb or in a park or in a farm or in a second growth forest. And sometimes our gated communities can become that sort of not in my backyard, right? We love our place the way it is. We don't want any changes. We don't want your windmills in our viewscape. We don't want your solar panels on our our housing association doesn't want our solar panels, right? So this nimbyism can be a kind of parochialism that keeps things out that don't appeal to the wellness, aesthetical, and spiritual uh, things that we crave uh, oftentimes in Western communities, right? So even though I love movements like ecological restoration and decolonization, there is a kind of streak within those movements to redeem to purify, to arrive at some authentic place, and then um, consider ourselves guilt-free, right? I've decolonized my life, I'm good. Or we've restored this ecosystem, it's now healthy, right? Uh, so I'm cautious of easy arrivals. And I think uh, another person that would back me up on this is Bio Kumalafe. He is a very powerful speaker and poet and writer. He's doing a lot of public speaking these days. Um, but he says, I like to say that sometimes the best answer to a pressing question is bewilderment. It's not the answer itself. It's not the correct answer. It's the gift of bewilderment. It's a gift of straying away from the algorithms of easy arrival. And my elders always taught me that the answers are not always going to be available. 
thank you, she's, he's speaking to the podcaster, thank you for holding the space for queer questions and uneasy arrivals, for tending to the tense fields where new kinds of beings and becomings can thrive and grow. Openness, a stance of openness and uncertainty, bewilderment. All right, that was three cautions. Now, I've got three troubles. I had to narrow them down. I had to narrow them down. One, therapizing place. I, th I think I made that word up. But there's a lot of my friends in forest therapy circles who are doing amazing work, but they tend to see places as places or as spaces to go and heal ourselves, right? Primarily looking at place through a therapeutic lens, right? That a, an hour in the forest can reduce your stress hormones and cure you of PTSD uh, and boost your immunity, all of which are true. No problems with those things. But placefulness doesn't start and stop when we're comfortable or when we're in a place that signifies nature or that uh, even is easy to breathe in, right? So there's going to be, there's going to have to be grief involved in, a, in any kind of authentic connection to our places, especially in the Anthropocene, right? So if I'm walking on here on the, on the seawall, this day is no less placeful than this day, right? Does that make sense, right? So we need new words to talk about that. One word coined by Australian philosopher Glenn Albrecht is solastalgia, right? This idea of comfort pain, not, rather than nostalgia, longing for a place that you're, no, you're not in. We're feeling the discomfort of the places we love changing before our eyes. So witnessing and resisting cultures of destruction, but not looking away and saying, well, now it's ruined. I can't have my spiritual experience here. I'm gonna go somewhere else, right? It's falling in love with a clear cut somehow, even with the pain of it. People like Donna Haraway use that term, staying with the trouble, right? This is where I get the troubles. And making kin, right? And strange kin, odd kin. So it doesn't come down to either, right, um, uh, apocalyptic narratives where it's all over, we're all, we're all done for, or these techno-optimist narratives, well, we'll figure it out in the next 30 years. Right, well, we might have to geoengineer the planet a little bit, but it'll be good, it'll be fine, right? So resisting that either or, those easy arrivals of apocalypse. Apocalypse is, it, it is an easy arrival, right? It's despair, it's giving up, but so is techno-optimism. And then Treby Johnson, who is a great organization called Radical Joy for Hard Times, and she basically encourages people to, to um, act, to enact, uh, gifts of beauty by making art and mandala in wounded places, right? Places that have been damaged or clear cut or, or uh, you know, chemically assaulted, right? So placefulness tries to wrap its arms around all of that in these very strange times. Second trouble, weaponizing place. Places are uh, really good weapons in, in a lot of our global conflicts, right? Around religion, around ethnicity, around identity. So sacred places are often enlisted in very specific ethno-nationalist agendas. Hindu nationalists are very good at this, of course, right? It, um, because they have so many sacred sites in Hinduism, right? And so, for example, if Modi talks about cleaning up the Ganges, Right? That sounds great to our ears in the West. But if, you, if a Muslim hears that, they hear, right? well, they're coming for our tanneries, right? because we uh, tan cow hides on the Ganges River. Right? So place is going to always be fraught with this weaponizing of place. Right? Israel-Palestine is not just a narrative of the, the imperial West right, invading the indigenous Palestine. It's much more dense and complicated when settlers are claiming to be returning to their homeland, right? So Israel-Palestine is fraught with that kind of tension around identity and place. 
The other trouble with weaponizing place is that places are very seldom, uh, you know, love of places are very seldom detached from all the ways that we like to divide each other up. Race, class, caste, and gender can sometimes determine whether or not you have access to particular places, whether it's a temple or a sacred site, right? Um, uh, uh, you know, caste in India, uh, restrictions on which caste can go where, worship in certain temples, right? These are often and historically uh, uh, our sense of place and our sense and our and knowing our place has always been sort of entangled, right? It's only this very strange democratic universalism, right, where we, we, we get this idea that everyone, regardless of, of race, gender, caste, creed, should have access to nature, right? And in a paradoxical way, I think that's rooted in a mystic placelessness, right? The, the Christian placelessness, where there's no Greek, no Jew, no male or female. So, um, that is very fraught, very dense, but that has to be understood, right, if we're talking about placefulness. Okay. Three, of course, troubling, uh, the, my third trouble is reconciling places. So placefulness, which is a spirituality for settlers and immigrants, the, you know, as I'm talking about it, as a, as a settler and immigrant, it's not just about communing with an objective nature, right, as opposed to culture, it has to recognize that when I go to Pacific Spirit Park, that's a beautiful second growth forest, but it's also the traditional territory of the Musqueam people who have lived there for thousands of years. So I'm not just in a forest, right? I'm in an abandoned food system, right? Uh, and these stumps uh, were places of, of uh, you know, resource harvest for indigenous people. And then uh, extraction by settler people, uh, and that supported the the you know rise of of the economy in British Columbia, right? So that is dense and interconnected. The blood on on settler hands, but also the the ways in which uh, many settler peoples were just trying to uh, make a decent living. That's not going to be resolved in my lifetime. So there's no easy way for me to arrive at Pacific Spirit Park and feel all, all good about that all the time, right? I want to carry that uh, ambivalence with me, right? And that's not always easy. But on the, on the reconciliation front, there's so many beautiful, wonderful things happening, right? The BC Treaty Commission, this move towards indigenous protected and conserved areas, uh, all of the settlements around rights and title where land is just being uh, uh, recognized as belonging to indigenous people. Co-management schemes and profit sharing schemes in, in forestry are at least moving in the right direction. But also land back movements, uh, land guardians uh, that are being funded by the federal government. Uh, land trusts, right? So private organizations that purchase land and, and then make it part of indigenous communities and all of the revitalization efforts. There's also some really interesting stuff, I have a slide on it, but this idea that perhaps settlers should pay a portion of their income or salary to a, a voluntary land tax or reciprocity fund. Uh, rather, and you know, my idea would be that any time that you give a land acknowledgement, you should donate $100 to an indigenous organization uh, so that it, it doesn't just become something that spills out of our mouths as a kind of matter of uh, appropriate etiquette. So we need to familiarize ourselves, not just with, you know, the Musqueam, Slow-Tooth, uh, Squamish peoples that we, that we can conveniently rehearse, but the dense uh, overlapping territories of indigenous, indigeneity in our part of the world and of our own settler heritages, our immigrant heritages, right? So this is a, a website, nativeland.org, where you can go through and look at the different layers of language, treaty, and, and territory. Um, listening to indigenous youth and leaders, the, the um, Faculty of Environment just had a great, well, I don't think it was Faculty of Environment, it was the, it was, okay. So we had a great talk, right, with um, 
uh, Panikpap, Leticia Pokiak, and Spencer Greening, who are indigenous uh, youth and leaders talking about all of the, all of the struggles and progress they've made in um, reclaiming territory and reclaiming their traditional way of life. And I love this quote from the talk right uh, from Spencer Greening saying, we just want to continue to live here. Right? This is in a big way um, something that you know, settler people and, and, and immigrant peoples can do is support indigenous initiatives and, and, and sort of get out of the way as they resurge and, and do their thing. Uh, another really important part of this conversation or, or things we can do as settlers, support indigenous artists and literature. So True to Place is happening at the Bill Reed Gallery uh, not far from here. It has some excellent art and stories associated with those with place, which is uh, you know, completely fused in the indigenous mindset. This Place is a, both a CBC podcast and a graphic novel that talks about the history of indigeneity in Canada. And another interesting one, uh, there's a First Nations version of the New Testament, which I included because one of the really unique features of the, of the text is that it translates all of the Hebrew names and place names into English, right? So Jerusalem is, you know, city of peace, and Jesus is Yahweh, our creator sets free, right? So all of the names and place names are translated, and it just opens up the text in a really interesting way even if you're not uh, indigenous. Uh, the, the SFU and, and UBC have a lot of place-based education models. So if you have kids, there's some like forest schools that are really involved in place-based education. And the education schools at UBC and, and, and SFU have diplomas and degrees in place-based models of education. SFU uh, you know, has, has been a pretty active partner in the reconciliation process, the Walk With Us uh, uh, document, and the, the First Nations Gathering House, which I think will open 2024. Another interesting thing, I see a lot of potential in this, but um, for now it's, it's, it's limited. But the Imesh app at SFU has both the location of indigenous artists at FU, but also Coast Salish place names. So it is kind of an interactive map where you can look up place names and then hear stories about them. I think there's a ton of potential in this for indigenous people that want to disclose uh, place names to the public that, that we could learn quite a lot about the history of places and the layers of history and the uses of places if they were more publicly available through bilingual signage or apps like Imesh. Uh, personally, I'm most excited about this idea of uh, it's coming out of Victoria. It's called the Reciprocity Fund. And basically how it works is you, you, if you're a landowner or a homeowner or a business owner, you put in your address and they'll calculate your monthly uh, reciprocity uh, fee. And so you can donate to these trusts and they go directly, well, 90% of the, of the funding goes directly to the nations that they use for revitalization projects, uh, language revitalization. Uh, they have it set up in Victoria. It's not quite set up in the lower mainland, but as soon as it is, I think I will join. I think it's a really interesting way for sellers to engage with indigenous resurgence without the sort of patronizing nonprofit model. And you know, one thing I like to say is something like this, reciprocity, it's not just a way for us to assuage our guilt, right? The idea of reciprocity is that reciprocity doesn't make you good, it just makes you human, right? It's not just, it isn't, you don't get to stop feeling guilty about it. You still have to wrestle with it, but it's, it's part of the process, part of the learning. All right, I'm, if you can believe it, I'm gonna wrap it up in two slides. So this is a tree right by my house. So like I said, my, my placefulness, a lot of it happens in my neighborhood, right? This is a London plane tree. Uh, and it has these beautiful sort of crossed elegantly branches. And I, uh, I, and I, I touch the bark every time I walk by. Uh, if no one's looking, I'll give it a hug, right? Um, or say hello. But like I say, placefulness is dense, it's fraught with tension, and it doesn't have to be in a wilderness, right? But it is investing 
energy in getting to know the, the topographies, the cycles, and the personhoods of our places. It's celebrating uh, our, our victories, our ecological restoration, and the healing right, that, we can, that we can affect on the land. It's witnessing and resisting uh, all of the change that's most certainly to come. Right? We're, we are in for some heartbreak in the next few decades. And, and maybe next few centuries. And so placefulness is a stance of readiness, right? We're ready to not look away, to not, um, to not, for not, to not appeal to easy arrivals, whether they're apocalyptic or techno-optimistic. And then staying with that trouble of, of reconciliation, of colonization, reflecting on our long troubled past, right? The deep and troubled present and the unwritten and troubled future. And I'll leave you with the words of Dudley from Wisdom Sits in Places. It's very good advice for us in this part of the world. He says, wisdom sits in places. It's like water that never dries up. You need to drink water to stay alive, don't you? Well, you also need to drink from places. You must remember everything about them. You must learn their names. You must remember what happened at them long ago. You must think about it and keep on thinking about it. That's placefulness. All right, thank you. All right. Good. Oh, we've got a whole half an hour. Now, uh, well, I'm sure some of you might have to leave. That's fine. But for those of you who like to discuss, we could do it one of two ways. I know some of you have some, some like questions and ideas percolating to the surface. One way would be kind of like, you know, question answer, but I'm not, I'm not up here to give you answers. Like it's not an expert sort of thing. So what I was hoping we could do is just cluster into groups of four or five and just sort of let it, whatever your, your reactions are, or questions, let it out, right? I love this, I hated this, here's my question. And then in, at, um, yeah, at 7.40, we'll, we'll come back together. And then those clusters will nominate one sort of crystallized question, right? And then you can present that, OK? So ask your questions to each other, right? Um, talk to each other. And then we'll come back at 7.40, and we'll, we'll kind of popcorn through the groups and, and nominate one question for that, for that little cluster, OK? So four or five folks, OK, just four or five. And then we'll get back together at 7.40. All right, we're back. Good. So let's have um, the instructions were the instructions were to cluster and then to crystallize a question or an idea that you'd like to, to discuss further. So we'll, let's just do that popcorn style, but you have to talk into the mic. Uh, for the for the filming, okay, sound good. All right, we want to start. Who wants to start? What what cluster would like to? All right, Brittany. Here we go. Get out of the way. All right. We were talking about feng shui, and we were wondering if cultivating your space is the same as just experiencing it. That's a great question. What do you think? <laughs> I want to say it is placeful, definitely. You're yeah. still fully rooting yourself in it. If anything, building it to your, your own needs for dwelling mm -hmm. is in and of itself creating space for you. Yeah. I think, I think both of those things have to happen a lot of the time, right? We need to get better at witnessing, experiencing, uh, being in the presence of our places and feel more comfortable with the idea that we're in a two-way relationship with them. Right? The, the excesses of modernity are to, to do that to an extreme, to modify things to our hearts. By two Christmas trees? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for example. Uh, or the inverse of that would be to say, right, humans are a cancer. We can't do anything good in the land, on the land. We can't have a reciprocal relationship. The gold standard is wilderness, and we are just guests in the wilderness, right? 
Those are two excesses on the same continuum. All right, so let's pass it over to here. Yeah, let's just popcorn through these clusters and see what comes up, what's bubbling. Hey, I'm going to try and put together, I normally I would write this out and think about it a bit, but um, I think the key term that came up in our discussion was the word responsibility. Mm. And um, we talked about wanting to wanting more of an em emphasis um, on the place where we are right now. What do the people whose lands we inhabit right now ask of us? What are their laws? I think that is a, an important place to start with. Um, and so I was thinking about Charlene Alec, matriarch and elder with a slow tooth who said, you're on our lands, so you have a responsibility to follow our laws. So that's a question I ask. I mean, she, she told me in very briefly, not just me, she told a public audience that for her, it meant that each and every one of us has a responsibility to look after the lands and the waters where we live and as well as each other. When you're, she said, when you're in Rome, do as the Romans do. You, you follow our laws. And I wanted to hear more, I wanted to hear that clarity mm -hmm. of this is where we are yeah. and this is who we have a responsibility to and these are what I, I never heard the word responsibility. So that was something that I heard, was listening. There were so many beautiful points. I was taking notes and taking pictures. Um, but also, when thinking of the Christian, or in this case, in your case, perhaps the Catholic tradition, um, the importance of the responsibility that comes with that tradition as well. And wanting to hear more in our group, we talked about wanting to hear a little bit more, even a sentence or two about the truth of that history, the ugly truth of that history. Um, just to hear that acknowledged mm -hmm. um, would go a long way, would have gone a long way. Um, to acknowledging a responsibility again. Yeah, that's the key word, right? Response. And actually, Donna Haraway uses that in in both senses, right? We have a we have a responsibility, but we cultivate the ability to respond. A response ability, right? And so both of those things are very well taken. We do have a responsibility, but my caution around whose land is it? is that for a lot of settlers, we want to be like, okay, it's their land, here's what I gotta to do to fix it, and not feel guilty anymore, right? But you know, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh have been in tension for a long time around some of the coastal wetlands in this, in this bay, right? That's tense, that's thick. There's a responsibility there, right? So settler peoples have a responsibility to make right, to, to, to fulfill all of the obligations we have from the top down, but from the bottom up, there's all these cool ideas like your friends, your friends um, asking, how, do, how can we be more responsible? And, and the, the one idea I had was the reciprocity fund. I think that's a really cool way to take my disposable income and leverage it for the uses of of these people. Reciprocity and responsibility, I think, are very closely. And in terms of the Catholic Church, I, I don't speak for the Catholic Church. And uh, Pope, Francis, Pope Francis was just in Canada and gave a public apology, which was met with uh, high praise and lots of criticism all around. I think it was a pretty powerful public um, step. There's still so much work to be done on the institutional side. And I, in no way am I an apologist or even in, invested in the institution. I'm more part of the tradition. So thank you so much for that.
Let's, pop, let's pass it to another cluster. Anyone would like to, to chime in? Yeah, we got one here. All right. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, not back there. OK, over here. I'm not sure I'm going to get this right. We didn't come up with any answers. <laughs> but one question that came up was, if the spiritual life is non-hierarchical, how can we bring that into our man-made structures, our man-made world? Yeah, I like that question. Are you part of a, a tradition? What tradition? A religious or a spiritual tradition? Well, I am a, a Quaker by convincement, but I call myself an isolated friend. Okay. So, yeah, so that non-hierarchical language coming out of that, the Quaker tradition, and that's really reflected in the, in the contemplative practice. So what you're asking, um, what you're wondering about is how that spirituality of, of, of equality can do what? Be brought into the world, like into yeah, the world, yeah. into, into society, into our institutions, into the way we interact with each other, yeah. with nature. It's a little easier in some ways with nature. Well, it gets complicated when we're dealing with human beings and human institutions. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not going anywhere with this. You're, no, that's a good, it's a really good uh, question to think with. I don't, I don't know if I have a response, and I, I would like to think with it too. Okay. Great. Uh, let's go back here. He had a hand. Did she had a hand first, and then over here? Let's go over here first, and then come back. Hi. Um, so, in your teachings today, you mentioned how Stephanie Mills believed that people must engage in physical experiences to restore our ecological systems. In your opinion today, how do you think that um, holy states can positively impact society's ecological footprints? Oh wow! It's like just right at me, huh? Sure. <laughs> Okay, so I need to hear it again, but can you just, yeah. can, it, can you paraphrase it with your own heart? Um, so like in your teachings today, um, after discussing Stephanie Mills' um, perspective, that people must engage in physical experiences to restore our ecological systems, how do you think um, our holy states and our perspectives of the land can positively impact society's ecological footprints? Well... That's a great question. So how, how is this, the intersection of my soul and this land connected to my impact on the land? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, how many of you have, have, have felt this in your own life, that as you grow in awareness uh, or connection to a place, you feel like you should do right by the place? Maybe we could crowdsource this one, right? Do you have a, in your own life there? Yeah, I know that we were talking as a group about like our experiences. And yeah, yeah. I don't want to. Do you want to share? Do you want to share your experience about the trees? Oh, yeah. About the, the trees? Um, oh, yeah. Um, sure. So um, I have tree friends um, from this guy train to the school where I work and talk to them every day. And. Um, and yeah, and so I'm very conscious of them. And I think as I walk by and I see some change that's happened to them, like paintbrushes tucked into their um, to their bark or a city sign that's telling them about, um, telling um, drivers about changes to the parking, um, how aware people are of what they're doing when they're in relation with that tree. So as they're tying that sign to the tree, did they ask, did they say, hey, do you mind if I put this sign here? Um, probably not, is my guess. Um, and on my way here, there's a young, a young kid who was swinging around a tree. And again, it's like, did you ask if you could do that? Like, it looks like you're having fun and you're playing, but maybe I personally wouldn't want to be swung off and around like that without somebody asking me anyways. So really um, just being very aware of, um, of the trees in an, an urban setting for one, right? That you don't have to go somewhere to have that relationship with these trees. These are trees that are in a little circle cut out of cement um, and probably roots um, intertwined with pipes and wires and heaven only knows what else is under these roads. So um, yeah, so it does make me very aware of them, very conscious of them when they're um, having their leaves when they're falling um, and just their whole lifespan. And yeah, I don't want them to be cut down. They're, they're my I like, friends. I really like that because we have a pretty severe case of plant blindness in the city 
where trees just end up being sort of scenery and background. So one of the things we'll do in my class in the, in the spring on trees and forests and the human imagination is pay attention first to the trees closest to where you sleep, right? And then move out from there, right? So that's something we do. And that's something we did in our workshop, right? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> that was great. It's good to see you in person, right? All right, so let's pass it down along here, this way. We got, here. We've got, yeah, we've got five more minutes, great. Um, around uh, one year ago, um, the Ministry of Environment, the lady, she said it takes uh, five minutes, uh, uh, it takes five hours to make a plastic cup. It takes five minutes to use it, but it takes 500 years to get recycled. We humans, we make cities, we build cities, we make technology, and there is no force in this, on this earth uh, to uh, stop us. To be honest, I mean, let's get realistic. I mean, um, when we, we can travel to the moon, we do it. But at the end of the day, we send the um, pilot to there, not the poet. Not, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, we miss the beauty, yeah, we miss tough. the depth. Yeah. We just do that, you know, very physical. So who said that? That was an astronaut who said what they I mean, should have said. I mean, you know, pilot, not the poet. Yeah, right? should have said poets. So and my sister says, you know, responsibility. I say another word: sacrifice. We don't use sacrifice. The flesh has to be sacrificed to the spirit. End of the story. And the, to learn the this is, is not easy. It's not pleasurable, it's not easy, it takes lots of discipline, lots of, you know, and to be honest, very few people of the people, I mean, every, you know, us ready to do this. Well, this so, is, the, you've, you've spoken exactly to the, what, what is the, what is the um, impulse of the modernist response is to substitute renewables for fossil fuels. Let's keep, the, let's keep civilization humming, and we'll just bring in res renewables and go with fossil No, no, my, my definition is, you fuels. know, there are different voices. One voice says, you know, we are a spirit. The other voice says, no, we are a flesh. We have to take care of this flesh, and don't worry about the other things. I give you, you know, analogies. Say uh, we are standing at the bank of the river, and we see, you know, the river comes from all the way from the way up from that tree, all the way back down there to a rock, okay? As far as we see the river, the, we can see that much. Behind that, you know, tree and rock, we cannot see the river. Now, how crazy it is if somebody claims the river is this, and don't ever say, you know, anything, you know, like this, we were born, and we, were di we die, and that is us. And this is crazy. We are not begin with, with our birth. We don't yeah. end with our death, with our yeah. death, you know? Yeah, so, it's beautiful. It's a, it's a very powerful spiritual idea. Let's get someone from the front here. Does this, uh, someone in the front or on this side? We haven't, yeah, let's go over here. And, We've been very this side centric. <laughs> yeah, we have a cluster. Oh, great. <clears throat> a cluster. A cluster. Thank you, Jason, for the talk. Um, I think we uh, talked about uh, in betweenness and contradiction quite a lot, and we appreciated how you weren't coming here to you know, give uh, solutions and uh, you were problematizing. Uh, overlaps and contradictions. And I think one of the things uh, we focused on is uh, spiritual activism, one of the phrases that you used. And we were, our question would be, um, how does uh, the, the spiritual activists, and there's different ways of doing this, relate to the, the polit political? in the sense of where does the spiritual uh, activism land mm -hmm. when it comes to, say, a kind of uh, materialist 
leftist, critical Marxist tradition, which uh, as a geographer, that is very uh, prominent, other disciplines too. But equally, uh, on the, a more conservative, uh, the so-called right-wing uh, element of the political, is spiritual activism, can it land anywhere in this spectrum? Or what is the relationship to the political more generally? And of course, in the background to this, uh, you know, the troubled times in your uh, title, uh, the troubled times involve this uh, wide-scale social polarizations of, uh, of the political, which is uh, also spiritual too, in a sense. So I think, um, yeah, how does spiritual activism relate to a political uh, praxis? Yes, I, all of us, I'm sure, have different answers to that. Yeah. One thing that comes to mind is, um, I just wrote an essay about um, apocalypse in first century Judea. And something I noticed in graduate school was that the, 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 the factions of Judaism in first century Palestine had a lot of, uh, an awful lot in common with the environmental movement. Right, so here's what I mean. So in the in first century Palestine, we had Sadducees. These were the temple elites, right? All they cared about was keeping the temple going. We had the Pharisees. And all they cared about was keeping the Torah, right, the lifestyle. And we had uh, the Zealots, who were revolutionaries, and all they cared about was killing Romans and anyone who, who, <laughs> who conspired with Romans. And then we had the Essenes. The Essenes ran out to the desert to wait for the Mashiach in the desert. Right, they were basically the hippie commune, right? So, so this 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 overlays very well with with spiritual activism. You have people who want to be at the table no matter what the cost, right? The the sort of big NGOs that want to have be at the table, and we might have to compromise, but we're at the table. We have the sort of green lifestyle folks who think that if you just live a zero waste life, then you're you're pure, right? Uh, or that everyone needs to just live this way and then we could, we'll, we'll all be fine. Or, or primarily concerned with individual footprints rather than structural change. And when we have the revolutionaries, right, which were basically, we need to, we can't have the conversation about climate change until we topple capitalism, right? And then back to the landers, like I said, right there, let's, let's just go back to the land, live the way that we should be living. Now, each of those have some truth. Uh, but in first century Palestine, Right, Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, comes along, and he's not in a scene. He he doesn't go out to the desert forever. He goes out sometimes, right? He goes he goes to the temple, but he's not a priest, right? He lives the law, but he says, "Let's up the ante and and really understand the spiritual roots of it," right? Uh, and so I think there is something about that analogy that applies here, right? It's a kind of all hands on deck. Right? It's a kind of everything we can do, but you're not personally responsible for changing the world by yourself. And that's why we're going to have to be willing to have our hearts broken because right, we have to stay sane in a, in a broken world. And there's going to be a lot of losses, but we're going to, try to have to, we're going to have to try to figure this out together. Anyone else want to chime in on spiritual activism? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, anyone want to chime in on this one? Because it's a really good one. Oh, it's great. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll send you the link for that essay if you want to read it. But All right, I think we have time for one more. In the modern Malay slide, you discussed how change to society, whether it's a street in your hometown or a whole city, can be a strange shift emotionally. So do you believe that once changed, a place no longer holds the original memory? And if so, how much does it have to change to no longer hold that memory? Well, that's a great question, right? Uh, but again, no easy arrivals, right? Just because it's, a, it's been clear cut doesn't mean it's not full of life still or that it could be life again. So you grieve what you've lost and then you start over, right? You grieve what you've lost and then you, 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 you make new memories. I think that's kind of where it's headed, right? So uh, avoiding any kind of easy apocalypse or easy, or just like uh, spiritual bypass. We're like, oh, it's fine. Everything's fine. I'm fine. It's fine, right? It's not, it's not, it's neither of those two things, right? Does that make, does that, does that speak to your question? Okay. Anyone else want to chime in on that? Has anyone, 
or anyone want to share experiences around that? Because I know that I know particular places and loss uh, can be really personal when it comes to place, and there are places that you don't want to go because of that that loss and that trauma, right? As a as a more trivial example. After a breakup, right? There's certain places in the city I don't want to drive past, you know, like <laughs> things like that, right? Like that, those kinds of things. That's a sense of place for you, right? But so you're talking about memory from the human perspective. Uh, I I am a human, yes. <laughs> I personally, from, yeah. From the human perspective, as opposed to the other than human memories and lives. That that's a great. That's, I, how would you? How do you tap into that? Let's get the mic down here. Tell me. Tell me more about. <laughs> Tell me more about your non-human. No, I, I don't know how to tap into that, but you asked for another mouth to talk, so. Oh, I, I didn't, yeah. So, so your, your question was about, was about memory and yeah, place yeah. And, and losing memory or when the place has changed. I don't have an answer for that, but, but the, que know. the question was like, are we talking about human memories or memories and experiences from the other than human? Yeah, it's, I mean, this is a really good place. Uh, this is a really good decentering of right of of the human. Uh, I'm I'm personally invested in my own memories, but getting to know a place is to try to tap into the memory of the place, and that has all kinds of dimensions. I mean, uh, sedimentary rock is the memory of the place, right? The meander of a river is the is the memory of a place. Is a memory of the place. Is what? It is a memory of the place, not the memory. Well, the, the accumulated right. memory, okay. right? The, the ongoing memory of the place, right? Would you agree with that? Perhaps. Okay. okay. Yeah, I, 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 I need to think about here. it over beer. Yeah, good. We've got to come here, and then we'll wrap it up. Well, just a, 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 a weenie reflection on that is that the way we talk about things, nouning them and thinging them, yeah. and Robin Wall Kimmerer talks about how indigenous languages you just talk about noun is a verb, which was brilliant. You Sorry, <laughs> nouning is a verb. So, anyways, go ahead. Um, thank you. Yeah, that was. Brilliant. I made a verb. Um, nouning that. I'm uncolonizing nouning. myself. Um, talks about indigenous languages. Oh, that they think of things as, as, actions. So they talk about instead of talking about a bay, a bay, they talk about baying. Because a bay does different things, and tides come in and out, and winds move around. And it's like that. So maybe the problem uh, here is a language problem that, that we would understand better if we were speaking an indigenous language. Yeah. Or, or you know, old English, right? Because there's lots of those compounds. Yeah, I don't know about old English. I only know what Robin Wall Kimmerer is. It's good. No, we'll, we, we'll talk, this guy and I. All right, thanks, everyone, for your time. Uh, stay in touch. Please, uh, please do stay in touch. My email was on the slides. I'm happy to share these slides with you, the quotes and the books and all those things. Uh, my website has a mailing list if you're interested in getting updates on books and talks and things. Otherwise, thank you all so much for your time.